Hello students. So in today's session, we will be discussing the chapter clinical risk assessment. So first you must understand what is the term risk. So risk means the chance or probability that an individual or person has in developing a particular disease. Okay, which in our case it is periodontitis. So there are many factors, okay, that increases the chance of an individual in developing periodontitis. So we will be discussing all those factors under different headings and how these will increase the chance of getting the individual periodontal disease. So coming on to the definition of risk. So you must know the definition of risk. Risk is the probability that an individual will develop a specific disease in a given period. And risk can be identified in terms of the risk elements are the risk factors, risk indicators, risk predictors, and risk determinants. You must know the definition of a risk factor, what is a risk indicator, what is a risk predictor, and what are risk determinants, and what comes under the following, following headings. So we will be discussing that in the coming slides. So, what is a risk factor? The risk factor is can be defined as any environmental, behavioral, or biological factor that, when present, increases the likelihood that an individual will develop the disease. So, when a risk factor is present, the individual can develop that particular disease. Okay. So. The risk factors for periodontal disease are tobacco smoking, diabetes, pathogenic bacteria, and microbial food deposits. So, coming on to tobacco smoking. Tobacco smoking, tobacco is a well-established risk factor for periodontitis. There exists a direct relationship between smoking and the prevalence of periodontal disease. So it has been noted that those individuals with increased use of tobacco, they show a higher periodontal probing pocket depth, an increased clinical attachment, a more alveolar bone loss, and a higher prevalence of gingival recession and a higher risk of tooth loss. Okay. It has also been noted that those individuals who are current smokers, who are smokers, they show a negative response towards periodontal therapy. That is, even if you do treatment for smokers, they might not respond in a positive way. There is no reduction, no much reduction in the probing pocket depth or clinical attachment levels in current smokers. Whereas in former smokers, we can see that former smokers are those uh, people who used to smoke before, but they are not currently smokers, right? So the former smokers, they respond in a similar way to non-smokers, okay? So smoking is a true risk factor for periodontitis. So whenever an individual, whenever, uh, whenever a person is using, like using tobacco, he is more prone Okay, he has a more chance of developing periodontal disease in the future. So that was the first risk factor. Now coming to the next risk factor, which is diabetes. So diabetes is also one of the strongest risk factors for periodontal disease. Okay, epidemiological data demonstrates that the prevalence and severity of periodontitis is significantly higher in patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes than in those individuals without diabetes. So, how does diabetes contribute towards the pathogenesis of periodontal disease? Okay, one is by their alter alteration in the polymorphonuclear leukocyte function, and there is an alteration in the collagen metabolism, and because of the high blood 
glucose content in the blood that enhances the growth of pathogenic bacteria. So in all these ways, it can, uh, diabetes can contribute to the pathogenesis of periodontal disease. So if a patient is diabetic, then there is a chance that he can get periodontal disease in the future. Okay, so diabetes is also a risk factor for periodontal disease. Now, coming on to the next factor, which is pathogenic bacteria and tooth deposits. So, what happens when plaque accumulates on the tooth surface? It can result in the development of gingivitis. Yes, but we can see that in some patients, there is only minimum levels of plaque. But we can see that there is severe loss of attachment in some patients. Okay. So, uh, it is not always the quantity of the plaque that is of major importance, okay? It is the quality of the plaque biofilm that is of importance. So, when we are talking in terms of the quality of the plaque, three specific bacteria have been identified as etiological agents for periodontitis, which is AA, PG, and Tanaria, Tanarella faucetus. Okay, if these three bacteria are present, then that individual is having a more chance of developing periodontal disease in the future. Now, coming on to our next category, that is risk determinants. So, what is risk determinants? Risk determinants or background characteristics, which is sometimes substituted for the term risk factor. Okay, so it is those risk factors that cannot be modified and under it we have genetics age gender socioeconomic status race and ethnicity so coming on to genetics so it has been noted that those individuals with interleukin one positive genotype they are having the chance of developing periodontitis Okay, they show more advanced periodontal lesions than the interleukin 1 negative genotype patients. And the immunological alterations such as neutrophil abnormalities, monocyte hyporesponsiveness to lipopolysaccharide stimulations in patients with localized aggressive periodontitis, and alterations in the monocyte macrophage receptor for the FC portion of the antibody. All this appears to be under genetic control. In addition, genetics play a role in regulating the titer of protective immunoglobulin antibody response and immunoglobulin G2 antibody response to AA in patients with aggressive periodontitis. Now, coming on to our next factor, which is age. So, both the prevalence and severity of periodontal disease has been noted to increase as the patient ages, okay? So the degenerative changes related to the aging may be one of the factor which increases the susceptibility of an individual to periodontitis. So as a patient, uh, as a person is aging, there might be a lot of degenerative changes which is happening in his body. So because of that, it can increase the susceptibility of a person to periodontitis. Then, Attachment loss and bone loss seen in older individuals can be a result of the prolonged exposure to other risk factors over a person's life, creating a cumulative effect over time. So, it can be due to the prolonged exposure to other risk factors, which can create a cumulative effect over time. And also, because of the decreased immune function, and because of the altered nutritional status in older population, all these factors interact and it can increase the susceptibility of older populations to develop periodontitis. So this is the another factor that is age. Now, coming on to the next factor, which is gender. So, it has been noted that the males are having a very poorer oral hygiene than females and the plaque scores are more in males. It's mainly because females are more conscious and they regularly maintain their tooth, but males, they do not maintain their tooth. 
so because of that there is a chance that males can develop periodontitis in the future so it appears that the gender difference in the prevalence and severity of periodontitis is related to preventive practices rather than any genetic factors so because of the preventive practices that is followed by females they are less prone to periodontal disease now coming to the next factor which is the socio economic status so we gingivitis and poor oral hygiene is can be related to lower socio economic status why because this lower socio economic status uh, uh, people they have a decreased dental awareness okay and they have a decreased frequency of dental visits okay because of their financial problems they might be visiting dentists they might not be visiting dentists okay so they are having a chance they are having an increased risk for developing periodontal disease now coming to our next factor that is stress so even though it is less noted stress also has an effect on the patient's general health as well as periodontia so stress can be seen in individuals with family issues in students during exams in patients who are uh, sorry in people who are facing economic uh, in in people who are facing financial crisis all these individuals we can see stress so this prolonged stress it has got a deleterious effect on the periodontia so it interferes with the normal immune function okay so what happens in stress is that there is an increased release of certain hormones like cortisol okay which has a major suppressive effect okay so they reduce the number of circulatory circulating inflammatory cells and also it inhibits the production of pro inflammatory mediators pro inflammatory mediators so thus the stress can increase the susceptibility of an individual to periodontal disease now coming on to the next next session that is risk indicators so risk indicators are probable or putative risk factor okay so these have been identified in cross sectional studies but not confirmed through longitudinal studies okay so the risk indicators under risk indicators we have hiv or aids osteoporosis and infrequent dental visits so now coming to the first category that is hiv virus or acute immunodeficiency syndrome so this hiv infection and aids increases the susceptibility to periodontal disease okay so studies have shown that the patients with hiv virus or acute immunodeficiency syndrome they are having a severe periodontal destruction characterized by necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis okay so these uh, patients are having a more risk of developing periodontal disease now coming to the next one that is osteoporosis osteoporosis is also another risk factor for periodontitis okay but studies in animals indicate that osteoporosis it does not initiate in periodontitis but in osteoporosis as we all know there is a reduced bone mass seen in this patient so this may aggravate periodontal disease progression okay so this can also be a risk factor for periodontitis now coming to the next factor is the infrequent dental visits so it has been noted that those individuals who fail to visit the dentist on a regular basis okay they are having a more chance of developing periodontal disease in the future okay now now we are coming on to the next session that is risk markers or risk predictors now what is a risk marker a risk marker is also associated with increased risk for the disease okay is associated with increased risk of the disease but it do not cause the disease okay the examples for them are the previous history of periodontal disease and bleeding on probing so previous history of periodontal disease is a good 
clinical predictor of risk in the future okay so those individuals who have already had severe loss of attachment okay they are at a greater risk for developing further future attachment loss okay whereas patients who are currently free of periodontitis okay they are having a decreased risk for developing periodontal uh, for developing loss of attachment than those who are currently have periodontitis now coming on to our next factor that is bleeding on probing okay so bleeding on probing is a best clinical indicator of gingivitis but bleeding on probing it alone does not serve as a predictor for attachment loss okay so when an individual is having bleeding on probing and coupled with increased po uh, pocket depth okay he is having bleeding on probing and coupled with pocket depth it can serve as an excellent predictor for future loss of attachment okay so those individuals with bleeding on probing and probing pocket depth can have a chance of developing periodontal disease in the future so these are the various categories of risk elements for periodontal disease you must know the definitions for each and what comes under each category okay now the clinical risk assessment so information that is concerning the individual's risk for developing periodontal disease can be obtained by careful evaluation of the patient's demographic data the patient's medical history when we are taking the medical history we can know whether the patient is diabetic or he is having osteoporosis he is having hiv etc okay and careful evaluation of the dental history and also clinical examination so once we collect all these data we will be able to identify which patients are at risk okay the analysis uh, the analysis of this can be accomplished by a healthcare provider or it can we can also analyze the patients at risk by the use of a computer based risk assessment tool an example for the computer based risk assessment tool is the periodontal assessment tool and once the patient at risk is identified and the diagnosis is made we can modify the treatment plan why are, why why do we want to see that a patient is at risk so that we can modify the treatment plan accordingly right for example okay if a patient with a history of cigarette smoking uh, uh, has like we are able during the history taking we came to notice that the patient is a tobacco smoker okay then they should be informed about the relationship of smoking and the periodontium okay and the impact of smoking on the periodontium and their prognosis prognosis of the patient should also be informed to this patient and the patient we should recommend the treatment plan for the patient which may include smoking cessation programs also okay and another example is that if a patient with severe chronic periodontitis a patient is diagnosed with severe chronic periodontitis he may be encouraged to be tested for an interleukin 1 positive genotype and if positive the treatment may involve the administration of systemic antimicrobials and host my host modifiers okay that we would not be using it for a patient with without like interleukin negative patient interleukin negative patient so uh, so if positive then if it is interleukin 1 positive genotype then we have to give the patient the administration of systemic antimicrobials and we can also involve the use of host modifiers that would not be used in a patient without this genetic marker so to conclude identifying the risk factor plays an important role in determining the diagnosis prognosis and outcome of the disease so if you are if we can identify a patient who is at risk to develop periodontal disease then we can modify the treatment plan accordingly okay so thank you all so we have come to the end of this chapter and thank you all for your patient listening